Today we'll be talking about bearing instruments and in particular about azimuth mirror and azimuth circles or they're also known as azimuth veins which are used to take visual bearings. So all vessels of over 1600 gross tonnage and over are required to have arrangements to facilitate visual bearings over the entire 360 degree arc of visibility. On some vessels or ships, you may find the azimuth veins, which you see on your screens here. They are quite different to the azimuth mirrors that we are going to be talking about today. So azimuth uh, veins, as you see on your screen here, uh, they have two mechanisms for taking bearings. In one, the rays of the sun are reflected from a cylindrical convex mirror that you see on your screen as well to a right angle prism on the opposite side of the ring and then through a cylindrical lens below appearing on the card as a bright bar of light so the light that appears as a bright bar on the card can then be used to read the bearings this method is specially used to take the bearing of the sun because the sun is so bright that it hurts the eyes of the observer sometimes so to take the bearings of the sun, we use the arrangement of the mirror and the prism on the opposite of the mirror. The other way of taking bearings of ships or stars or land objects consists of the slight veins, the sight veins, the hairline and the reflector. And this is used to take the bearings of terrestrial objects. So we line up the terrestrial objects with the hairline and then read the bearing through the side veins. So this is the azimuth vein. But today's focus is more on azimuth mirror because uh, this azimuth mirror is uh, slightly different and a bit complicated to be use for people who have never used it before. And that is why I thought I'll focus my today's uh, presentation on azimuth mirrors. But before we understand about azimuth mirrors, we need to study a little bit about refraction and reflection of light because that is the concept used by the azimuth mirrors to take the bearings. So what is the principle of refraction? Well, a naturally occurring phenomena, uh, refraction can be defined as a change in the direction of a ray of light as it passes from one medium to another of different density. So light that enters exactly at 90 degrees to the medium undergoes no refraction. Light that enters from low density medium to high density medium bends towards the normal. The normal is a 90 degree line. And light that enters from high density to low density bends away from the normal. So in this on this on your screen right now, you I will show you what happens when light passes from a optically lighter medium to an optically denser medium when it bends towards the normal. So you can see this is the optical lighter medium on top and then we have the optically denser medium at the bottom. The yellow vertical line is the normal which is the perpendicular line. You can see that light enters from the optically lighter to optically denser and bends towards the normal that is bends towards the vertical yellow line. If you see here, there are stages of refraction. In this case, the optically lighter medium could be air and the optically denser medium could be glass. And when the light enters exactly at 90 degrees, we'll see that there is no refraction. The light just passes through. All right. I'll show you what happens when the light enters from optically denser to optically lighter medium the light will bend away from the normal. In some cases, the light or the refracted ray does not leave the glass at all. As I will show you through the animations. So the light enters from the optically denser to optically lighter medium at a certain angle. And at this particular angle, the light will travel along the medium and does not leave the medium at all. In this case, this is called the critical angle. So the critical angle 
is the angle at which a light does not leave the medium but travels alongside it. There is another concept called the total internal reflection. In this case, the light enters from the optically denser medium to the optically lighter medium, but instead of going through it, it internally reflects as you will see here on your screen. So the light does not leave the medium and internally reflects. In this case, the angle of incidence, that is the angle at which the light strikes the medium, equals to the angle of reflection, the angle at which the light ray reflects on internal reflection. Now we are studying all these concepts to understand how an azimuth mirror uses these concepts of refraction to, towards its working. Because the azimuth mirror uses a prism. That prism is of the sides are of 60 degree angle to each other. The reason it uses 60 degree will be explained right now. If the prism was of a 45 degree angle, the light from an object had to strike exactly at 90 degrees to the prism for total internal reflection to take place and the reflection to go into the observer's eyes. If the light had struck the prism at any other angle other than 90 degree, the observer would not be able to take visual bearings using the prism. When it comes to a 60 degree prism, you can see that irrespective of what angle the light strikes the side of the prism, prism can be twisted around or played around with to adjust in such a way that the concepts of internal reflection and refraction can be used to obtain bearing of objects as you see on your screens here. So a, six, a prism with 60 degree sides works perfectly well to obtain the bearings. In this case, prism, the lights can be incident at any angle but then you can see here it's a different angle this time. You can adjust the sides of the prism and I'll show you how it's done to make sure that the reflection of the light or the reflection of the observer or the reflection of the object goes into the eyes of the observer for it to be able to take a bearing, whether it's a celestial object or a land-based terrestrial object. All right. So this is what an azimuth mirror looks like. So this is got a prism arrangement that you have you can adjust it with the circles on the side that you see with the arrows you can twist it around to adjust the angle of the azimuth mirror in such a way that you can obtain bearings of the terrestrial as well as the celestial objects now if i show you through animations it basically uses the principles of light that is refraction to do so all right so the azimuth mirror is basically a device which when used in conjunction with some form of compass or compass repeater will enable bearings to be taken of either terrestrial or celestial objects. The azimuth mirror is so called because light is reflected by the prism in a way that it acts similar to a mirror. By making use of the property of total internal reflection, prisms are often used in optical instruments as reflectors instead of mirrors. Like I said before, the azimuth mirror consists basically of a 60 degree total reflecting prism which can be rotated by means of a milled wheel attached to it shown with the arrow facing up. The prism is situated above a sighting tube which contains a convex lens for magnifying the compass card. The whole arrangement of prism and the sighting tube rests on top of the compass and it is pivoted so that it can be rotated to any desired direction. Using the azimuth mirror, when the azimuth mirror is used to take the bearings of a terrestrial object of a or of a celestial body with very low altitude, the prism is used to reflect the image of the compass card into the eye. The observer looks over the top of the prism at the object in question and sees below it at the same time part of the compass card. Observer is thus able to determine the bearing of the object by simultaneous comparison of the object with the compass card raised as it were in the view. As I stated earlier, the milled wheel arrangement by which the prism is rotated often has an arrow engraved upon it. When the azimuth mirror is used to take bearings of objects such as terrestrial objects or celestial objects at very low altitude, the arrow should be pointing downwards. 
So what you actually see is this arrangement here. You see the terrestrial object with your naked eye, but you can see the compass card from your other eye through the sighting tube. The key part here with terrestrial objects is that the bearing that you see here is basically always inverted. So sometimes observers can make errors in reading the bearings. So when it comes to terrestrial objects, the bearings that you see on your compass card will always be inverted. So make sure you read the compass card carefully to get the right bearing. When we talk about bearings of celestial objects, when the azimuth mirror is used to take the bearing of a celestial object, then the prism is used to reflect the image of the celestial body into the user's eyes. The observer looks down the sighting tube at part of the compass card and at the same time sees superimposed on the card the reflection of the body in question. The observer is thus able to determine the bearing and the azimuth of the body both at the same time. So you will see that the image of the body while glancing just outside the line of the prism close against the graduation rim of the compass card as you see on your screens here. So in this case you can see both the image of the body, the reflected image of the celestial body as well as the compass card both together at the same time. The image of the celestial body is kind of superimposed on the compass card. It makes it easier to take bearings of high altitude celestial bodies. Now like any other bridge instrument, the azimuth mirror is also prone to certain errors due to wear and misalignment. Now as with all instruments with mechanical and moving parts, the azimuth mirror is also prone to errors. The azimuth mirror can be checked from time to time for errors. A celestial body with low altitude should be observed both with the arrow up and with the arrow down. That is looking over the top of the prism and looking down the side tube. If the two bearings are identical, then no error exists. If however the two bearings are not the same, then an error is present. The value of the error is half the difference between the two readings and this amount, that is the value of the error, should be applied to all subsequent bearings observed. If the smaller reading obtained was that obtained with the arrow down, then the error should be, error should be added to all sub subsequent bearings taken with the arrow down and vice versa. In this example on the screen, you can see the bearing of the low star taken with the arrow up was 3 to 1 and with the arrow down was 3 to 3. So what correction should be applied to all subsequent bearings? Well, the mean was 3 to 2 and the error in this case is 1 degree. So we will be applying a correction of 1 degree additive to all bearings taken with the arrow up and apply a correction of 1 degree negative to all the bearings with the arrow down. In terms of care and maintenance, if an error exists, check that the axle and bearing are not misaligned, screws are not loose, bent, etc. If simple maintenance repair does not eradicate the error, do not try and remove the prism from its holder, but send the azimuth mirror ashore for collection at the earliest opportunity. The other items of periodic check and maintenance in an azimuth mirror can be summarized as keeping glasses, shades and lenses cleaned and salt free keeping the axle shade pivots oiled and free, applying light smear of a clean grease such as Vaseline to base plate to allow it to turn freely on repeater or compass top, and remove and store the azimuth mirror when not in use or use the canvas covers provided on the ships to protect against water, moisture or bad weather. So I hope this video helped you to understand the concept of azimuth mirror. These azimuth mirrors are uh, sometimes uh, not found in commonly in most of the ships but if it is found then you must know how to obtain it a slight disadvantage of the azimuth mirror is that sometimes when you are trying to take bearings of a star at night you are trying to obtain the image of the star you may get lost while looking at the sighting tube it gets a bit complicated but at the same time an advantage is that you can easily take bearing of a very high altitude object which is not the case with the azimuth vane. With the azimuth vane, if the object has very high altitude, sometimes it's very hard to obtain the bearing. So let me know what you thought about this video. I'll see you soon with my next video. All the best with your studies and thank you very much.
to everyone for subscribing and watching the videos. Bye guys. See you soon.